Just as Peter overcame the fear of getting out of the boat, fear strikes again. This is oftentimes when many people quit. They say, see, I knew I shouldn't have gotten out of that boat. I knew I shouldn't have tried. And they talk themselves out of walking in God's purpose. They believe those obstacles mean that they're headed in the wrong direction and start to become distracted. Hello, beloved, and welcome to Beloved Women with me, Christina Patterson, where we help women to learn, love, and live God's word. If you're new here, please be sure to subscribe for new videos each week. And for those of you returning, welcome back. For beloved Bible studies, daily devotions, study guides, and unlimited ad-free videos to grow your faith, I invite you to join me in downloading the Beloved Women app. Today's video is part of our Crazy or Called Bible study series as we learn what happens when God calls ordinary people to extraordinary purpose. You can find the link to the entire series below and get your copy of the Crazier Called Bible Study Guide at thebelovedboutique.com or on Amazon. When my children were younger, we spent a lot of time at the kiddie pool in our neighborhood. It was there I was able to keep an eye on them, but when it was time for my daughter to learn how to swim, I took her to what she calls the big pool. When I did so, she questioned why I could not teach her how to swim in the one and a half foot kiddie pool. After all, this is where she felt the most comfortable, confident, and secure. But she would not be able to learn how to swim in the kiddie pool. So I had to explain to her that she would not be able to learn how to swim in the kiddie pool. It's simply not deep enough to swim. We could play there, sure, but that's all we could really do. If we wanted to do more than just splash around, we needed to walk our way over to the junior Olympic sized pool and get in deeper waters. As we answer God's call on our lives, we'll find that he leads us to deeper waters often with obstacles that seem to get in our way. We'll want these obstacles to move so we can have a clear path towards purpose, but God will lead us to his purpose despite any obstacle or challenge that may arise. When God calls you, even the obstacles you face are not here to drown you, but to teach you how to swim. It's in deeper waters that you learn how to rise above the waves and see the very strength of God in your life like never before. Because when God moves you from the kiddie pool to the big pool, you're going to pray a little harder. You're going to read your Bible a little longer and listen to God more intently. Maybe your intention is to figure out the fastest way back to the kiddie pool or the shortest distance to avoid the challenges that we face in life, but God will use these obstacles to teach you how to overcome. If we thought that answering God's call would be a linear and clear path, we're mistaken. Oftentimes, this path is filled with challenges, disappointments, pivots, and delays. There's just no straight shot when it comes to discovering and answering God's call on your life. It's a process. Peter, who was a fisherman but called by Jesus to become a disciple, gives us a glimpse into what that process looks like. As we look at the time he is called to walk on water, we discover three obstacles we will face when we step out to answer God's call on our lives and how to overcome each one. We read the beginning of the account in Matthew 14 verses 22 through 27 that says, Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. We learn that after ministering with his disciples, Jesus sends them ahead of him on a boat so that he can have some time to pray. While in the boat that evening, the Bible tells us that the disciples made it a long way from the shore, meaning they were in deep waters. And at the same time, the boat had been 
beaten by the waves because the wind was against them. So essentially, Jesus sent them into this storm. I wonder if they were confused as we are during times where we feel like we're doing what God wants us to do, but are met with opposition. When we're doing our best to walk in God's direction, but the winds of opposition are pushing us back and beating at us. But I love that Jesus sees this storm and knows that his disciples will be afraid. And he's right because Peter and the other disciples are in the boat already shaken about this storm. So when they see what they think is a ghost walking on water towards them, they now have another reason to be scared. But Jesus comforts them with these words, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Fear is often the first obstacle we must face when it comes to answering God's call on our lives. Fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of the opinion of others. It all stops us from walking in our purpose, which is why over and over again, the scriptures tell us, do not fear. This command always comes with a promise. Whether God was talking to Joshua before he led the Israelites into the promised land, or when he was directing the Israelites in Isaiah, or comforting David in the Psalms, the call not to fear is always accompanied by the promise of God's presence. As Jesus called the disciples into deep waters and into wind and waves that were against them, his presence was the reason they did not have to fear. And the same is true for us. Notice that the disciples weren't only afraid of the waves and the wind, but when they didn't recognize Jesus at first, they were afraid of him. They thought he was a ghost. Many times we have fear when it comes to answering God's call on our lives, especially when we don't recognize who God really is is. To overcome fear, it's not enough for us to simply know that God is with us. We have to know that he is for us. Because if we don't, not only will we fear the call, but we will fear God. And not in a reverential way as far as fear him, as honor him, but as being afraid, scared of him, unsure if he really has our best interest in mind. So what do we do if we're really not sure about God? Well, we can do what Peter did, ask for confirmation. Matthew 14 verses 28 through 29 tells us, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. When Jesus confirmed who he was and Peter believed, he was able to walk on water. When we have assurance of God's presence in our lives and purpose on our lives, we can do things we never thought possible. But fear is not the only obstacle we must overcome as Peter would soon learn because although he was in the presence of Jesus and walking on water and overcoming fear, the winds and the waves did not stop. There would be more obstacles to overcome. In Matthew 14 verses 30 through 33, we read, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son. Of God. Fear is like a virus. It's hard to get rid of. Just when you think it's gone, it comes back with a vengeance. Just as Peter overcame the fear of getting out of the boat, fear strikes again. This is oftentimes when many people quit. They say, see, I knew I shouldn't have gotten out of that boat. I knew I shouldn't have tried. And they talk themselves out of walking in God's purpose. They believe those obstacles mean that they're headed in the wrong direction and start to become distracted. Which brings us to the second obstacle we learn from Peter that we must overcome if we want to answer God's call on our lives. Distraction. We read that it was when Peter saw the waves that he started to sink. As he walked on water, he started off well, looking at Jesus as we often do. But then the crashing waves commanded his attention and he 
obeyed. He looked away from Jesus and started to sink. A focus on Christ is what enables us to walk in God's purpose for our lives, but too often we get distracted. Now, the distraction we face might not be waves from a storm, but our short attention spans are easily seduced by many shiny objects in this world. We often get caught up in protocol and think that we have to do this or know this person or have these resources to faithfully answer God's call on our lives. But all God is telling us to do is keep our eyes on him. We can make things complicated by looking at distractions when all Jesus told us to do was seek first the kingdom and that everything else would work itself out. When we're not focused on God, we'll find ourselves trying to help God out by doing things that he didn't call us to do. And what we're really doing is sinking because the goal of the call is the journey towards God. And once we lose that focus, we are no longer on our original mission. The waves and the wind will always be there, but so will Jesus. And so we have a choice as to where we will look. Will we compare ourselves to others and try to do what they do? Will we Google search all the answers and not consult God? Will we believe our challenges are greater than God because they sure will look that way if all we do is stare at them and not God? To faithfully answer God's call on our lives, we need to look straight ahead to make eye contact with Jesus and trust that no distraction is worth our attention off of him. What I love about Peter is that although he started to sink, as we all will at certain points in our lives, he knew exactly what to do. He called out to Jesus, Lord, save me. The distractions of this world are so enticing, so captivating, so intoxicating that it can be hard to let them go. But it's then that we can call and cry out to Jesus to rescue us. The Bible says immediately, with no hesitation, Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of Peter. There is no too far gone with Jesus. God's hand is mighty and he can reach down to the lowest lows and deepest depths to rescue you when you've been captured by the world because you are not the world's. You are his. When fear enters our hearts and distraction wins our attention, we'll find ourselves in places that we can't get out of on our own. We'll have to call on the power of God to rescue. This is why Peter didn't call out to the other disciples. He called out to Jesus. I think sometimes we're hesitant to call out to God because we're ashamed. We have to be humble enough to ask God to dig us out of holes that we dug ourselves. There is someone who's distracted, who's off course, who's lost their way, but Jesus has not lost you. Call out to him so that you can see that he's been with you the entire time, waiting for you to take his hand, ready to pull you up out of deep waters. It's what Jesus says to Peter after he rescues him that reveals our final obstacle that we must overcome to answer God's call. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter did start with faith. He didn't have much of it, but he started well. He believed, but then he got distracted by the waves. And that's when he started to question his belief. He started to doubt. Usually we don't start with doubt. We start with fear or distraction. Doubt is an obstacle that sneaks its way in right when we're walking on water, right when we found our stride or made progress. Its purpose is to get us to turn around and its cure is faith to keep going anyway. Many times we get off course from God's call on our lives because doubt causes us to question the call. And if we're too busy questioning the call, we'll lose focus to answer the call. Every time an obstacle comes, we will see it as a sign that we made the wrong move and doubt will grow. We'll shrink back, we'll turn around, we'll sink like Peter. Faith reminds us that God is greater. He is a promise keeper and will give us the strength we need to get back up when obstacles knock us down. Faith helps us to see that obstacles delay us, but they cannot stop us if we choose to keep going. Doubt, on the other hand, tells us to stop while we're ahead and to quit when we really need to keep going, get back up, and try again. The Israelites marched around Jericho seven times before the wall fell. Elijah sent his servant seven times to look for a sign of rain before they saw it. Hannah prayed over and over again for a son before she conceived. Sometimes you have to go again 
over and over again to get to where it is that God is calling you. We want the journey to be a straight shot, but God is more concerned with working on our hearts than simply getting us to a desired destination with the shortest route possible. Sure, doubt is going to make you want to quit. The enemy will be right there in your ear telling you to give up on that marriage, give up on that dream, give up on that business, give up hope for that child, and the weight of serial failure will make you want to stop. But if we're talking about something that God is calling you to, if it's about experiencing the manifestation of God's promise in your life, then you have to go again. Because if God's hand is on it, the enemy can only make you think you're defeated with doubt. Doubt says you failed. Faith says you're learning. Doubt says you're wasting your time. Faith says God is working things out in his perfect timing. Doubt says it won't work out. Faith says God is in control. Doubt says it's beyond repair. Faith says God has the final say. Doubt says the dream is too big. Faith says my God is bigger. Doubt says you're crazy. And faith says you're called. Jesus rescued Peter. They returned to the boat and it was then that the wind stopped. Jesus could have stopped the wind and waves to make Peter's walking on water more comfortable, but he didn't because he didn't want Peter to rely on everything being perfect, but on him. God will allow winds and waves into our lives, even as we are obediently following him to remind us it's not a perfect life we need, but him alone. Peter's call to walk on water wasn't simply about walking on water. As miraculous as the experience was, there was a deeper purpose. Jesus needed to teach Peter a very important lesson, a lesson we must all understand. Obstacles will always be on our path towards purpose, but they are not always there to get in your way. Sometimes they are the way. Stay tuned for a sneak peek at next week's video brought to you by our beloved women members who support our mission to empower women with the love and truth of Jesus Christ. Our members receive exclusive access to beloved women videos, Bible studies, printable study guides, and more. If you like beloved women, you will love being a beloved women member. Learn more and join today at belovedwomen.org. Now enjoy a preview of next week's video. Paul was great because he wasn't focused on being great. Throughout his writing, there is a common theme of humbling himself so Christ could become greater through him. In one of my favorite scriptures in Philippians chapter three, verse eight, Paul writes, indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. This is an important lesson for all of us. We don't have to be great, have the biggest following, be the best, or have the most to successfully answer God's call on our lives. Many times those things can get in the way. So we need to learn how to humble ourselves and focus on making God great, not us. If you feel unqualified, it might be time to take the focus off of your weakness and focus on Christ's strength and power. Paul learned that coming under a call greater than yourself is actually a good thing. 